Okay, so, so dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome to another session of the Leuven Seminar in Classical German Philosophy. Um, today, we'll have three short papers on the idea of revolution in Kantian and early post-Kantian philosophy. And we will have a paper on Kant, a paper on Fichte, and a paper on Erhard. Uh, the structure will be the following. Uh, each speaker will have 25 minutes to present the paper, and it will be followed by a 15 minutes discussion. So in total, we will dedicate 40 minutes to each paper. And um, our first speaker today is Paula Romero. Uh, she's a postdoc researcher at the University of Freiburg. She has a PhD in political theory from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, her research has developed in the areas of political philosophy, moral philosophy, and the history of political thought. She has several publications such as uh, why Carl Schmidt and others got Kant wrong uh, in Contextos Kantianos uh, 2021. And uh, perhaps relevant to our topic today, uh, Kant and Hegel, uh, Revolution and the Politics of Fear in Hegel Jahrbuch uh, 2017. Uh, she is currently working on a new book on uh, Kant's notion of political willing and uh, and without further ado, uh, thank you very much for being here today, Paula. And uh, she will deliver a paper entitled Kant's Ammunition Against Revolution, Law, Freedom, and Power. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Luis Felipe, for your introduction. And of course, thank you to Pavel and to Karen for the invitation very kind invitation. I wish I was in Leuven. It's a place I, I love visiting and, and I feel very at home in your university. So thank you very much. So um, this paper is born out of an interest to understand the role of power in Kant's political and legal philosophy. What can think that any political theory that defends an account of political authority that offers a theory of the structure of government um, like Kant does, that offers also an unconditional duty to obedience, will always have power as a key and clearly identified element of its theory. But power as a political notion seems to be operating everywhere and nowhere in Kant. There seems to be a lack of clear understanding of the systematic role played by the notion it's a kind of like a blind spot of his philosophy. And I think that there is an explanation for this um, that has to do on the one hand with Kant himself, and on the other hand um, has to do with the way we read Kant. Power does indeed figure in Kant's writings, but not as a constant definition. Sometimes he refers to it as force, as violence, as coercion, and as the specific characteristic of the executive power. In addition to these um, difficulties of finding the notion and understanding what it means, the notion seems to come to Kant's aid in the specific context of its discussion of revolution and a no right of rebellion. Effective power, as we will see, seems to be the response that to what Kant sees as illegitimate and illegal attempts to overthrow an existing constitution, to bring about a whole scale replacement of the political structure. But as I said, there's a difficulty here because the notion appears in the context of a broader debate about legitimacy and authority. I mentioned there is also a difficulty in the way we read him, a problem with us, not just with Kant. Much of the interpretative efforts that I call overly juridicist or overly legalistic of Kant's political thought have focused on the institutional solution he offers to the problem of conflict that arises from the fact that we're free 
that our freedom affects the freedom of others in the exercise of our choice. This exercise of freedom needs, one, one can think in a sort of a bit of a caricature of Kant, this exercise of freedom needs to be regulated. And furthermore, the institutional reading tends to assume that things are going to go well, that once public authority is established, our rights will be protected and legislation will be legislated from an omnilateral point of view and not from a partial and arbitrary one. So one of my interests of bringing the notion of political power to this conversation today is that it, focuses, it forces us to focus less on when things go well and invites us instead to understand how can things that political authority must operate when things don't go to plan. And that's when revolution, the conversation of revolution comes in. So today I want to ask not the question, what makes political authority legitimate or what are the conditions of possibility of political authority, but rather the following question. Once established, is the Kantian juridical condition hermetically safeguarded of the threats of degeneration and dissolution? I think that just like Hobbes, Kant was triggered by revolution as a problem. And of course, by the French revolution is in the background. Kant was triggered to see that the preservation and stability of the state or the juridical, the juridical condition, broadly speaking, cannot be guaranteed by sheer legislation, the legitimate mechanisms of law and by the defense of freedom. What I'm saying is that law and freedom for Kant are not enough. We need a third constitutive element of political authority in operation. And the good thing about this is that I'm not making it up. Um, Kant says it himself in an important passage from the anthropology that it's, it's, a, it's fascinating because this is the passage that people read. This is the place where he's dealing with the taxonomy of good and bad governments or degenerations where he talks about despotism, barbarism. I never bothered to keep on reading that passage. And then I, this came up and I thought this is, this is fascinating. Kant says, freedom and law by which freedom is limited are the two pivots around which civil legislation turns. But in order for law to be effective and not an empty recommendation, a middle term must be added, namely power, gewelt, which when connected with freedom, secures the success of these principles. But what is power and what does it add to the equation of freedom and law? What we can see clearly so far is that Kant integrates power as a necessary element in his tripartite conception of political authority. It is an ingredient without which the law would be inefficient. It can surely be the jure law, but not the facto law. And where the exercise of freedom would be unlimited, unless limited by the two components, both law and power. So what I want to propose is the thesis that the role of power in this conception of political, Kantian conception of political authority responds to three fundamental assumptions in Kant's thought. And this is the more speculative part of my, of my talk. Um, and as I said, these, these as I mentioned earlier, these assumptions in Kant's thought result from his engagement and his analysis of revolution. So that's how, that's how, why my talk is in the context of a, of a panel about revolution, because this is, this is the, the, the background thinking that triggers Kant to assume political authority in this way. That's the logic of the argument. So the tripartite conception of power, law, and freedom is based on three assumptions. The first, that Kant accepts that even in the presence of an established institutional framework, conflict persists as an unavoidable fact of relations of freedom. This means that even within the structure of the juridical condition, a destabilizing element persists, which makes all civil conditions fragile 
and at risk of dissolution. I think this assumption has huge implications and can partly explain the need of power as a middle term mediating between freedom and law. The first assumption implies the second one, namely that a juridical condition can have moments of instability and illegitimacy already within the apparent legitimate structures of lawful institutions. I'm going to say that again differently. What I mean by this, and I'll have to say a lot, I'll have a lot to say about this, is that the juridical condition is not always maybe prone to immediate dissolution, but it is internally fragile and open to situ situations of abuse of power, of injustices that are not necessarily whole scale injustices, but locuses of injustice. And I take this thought from Helga Varden calls this, and I, I love the way she, she phrases this, pockets of barbarism that can be found within an apparently normal and legitimate structure of government. The civil condition, I think, for Kant is open to the rise of anarchy and open to blind spots in the use and misuses of law. And finally, I think that this interlocking of freedom and law through the mediating element of power as force or effective coercion shows that Kant understood these political pathologies and abuses such as anarchy or these pockets of barbarism, not merely as degenerations or um, erosions of the ideal state, a state. I think that we tend to think of there is the ideal state and when we look at these situations of injustices they're just degenerations of that in a kind of platonic sense. I don't think that's what's going on in Kant as if what we when we see these pathologies of, of abuse of power it's a sort of banana republic of the ideal republic and you can quote me on that because I think it sounds catchy but rather what these um, situations of injustices are, or I want to defend, are real possibilities for Kant that emanate in any state. They are sort of integral to the dynamics of law, freedom, and power, not just the generations. And they are real possibilities in our own democratic, stable, and progressive states. What I want to highlight is that all these conditions are possible in Kant's practical horizon. Let me just take a bit of water. And I think there are benefits in taking Kant seriously in his insistence that freedom and law are not enough in keeping a coherent view of political authority. One of the benefits is that it allows us to read this, this combi tripartite combination of freedom, law, and power allows us to read the uncomfortable passages where Kant seems to be defending de facto governments only because the alternative of no government is much worse. What he is warning us against is to our tendency to judge current constitutions from the perspective of the ideal and specifically of the ideal of freedom independently of law and power with an eye to overthrow current constitutions given their, their, alleged, um, their, their alleged shortcomings and deficiencies. As Kant says, even though this constitution may be afflicted with great defects and gross faults and be in need of um, important improvements, it is still absolutely unpermittable and culpable to resist it. In line with my suggested interpretation, and just to give you an idea, I'm in the middle of the talk, this awareness of the fragile nature of all political authority is nevertheless backed by a commitment to preserving the sacred and irresistible authority with power in relation to law and freedom. So another benefit of assuming power as a Kantian notion at the, at the heart of, of Kant's analysis is that it allows us to theorize, or so I want to suggest, the two extreme situations that worry Kant the most. 
So I think that Kant is operating. I mean, imagine, imagine, imagine Kant imagining. I think I see. I think he sees political theorizing in the middle of two extremes. One extreme is that of a condition of abuse of power. We have here the most well-known cases in Kant. We know this end very well, despotism, paternalism, when the sovereign power judges from his private will and so on. I think we've, we've spent a lot of time on this end, on the end of the abuse of power. The other extreme, and I think this is the most interesting one, is that of the condition of the absence of power. So in, this is the these are the conditions that emanate from the abuse of power. At the other end, we have conditions that are the result of the absence of power. And it is interesting to know that for Kant, both the excess of power and its absence are two pathologies that equally destroy political life. So what I'm trying to push to push is really that power is central because its absence would, all, would also generate all these other problems. This condition of absence of power can't, com can't comes closer to telling us what it would look like. I think when he used the word anarchy, and that's why revolution is, is in the back of, of all of this. He calls anarchy a sort of, a, a moment of juridical vacuum, so to speak. And he articulates this condition as the inevitable result um, of revolutions. So the way it works for him is that since revolutions begin by necessarily destroying the existing constitution and yet a new one needs to be established, this leads, and I quote, to an intervening moment when the entire jurid juridical state of affairs would be annihilated. We can see how a juridical void of this kind for Kant is as threatening as despotism. And we can also see how power, that is the effective strengthening of freedom and law through coercion, through effective coercion, is called for to guarantee the stability of the state. There is a problem, of course, with all of this, or the way I've been reading it. Is any kind of political authority better than none at all? How can we square the fact that political authority must be exercised legitimately, but at the same time, it is always preferable to have de facto authority than to have none at all? These seems to be some of the implications of these passages. In Kant's own words, for any legal constitution, even if it is only in a small measure lawful, it is better than none at all and the fate of a premature reform would lead to anarchy. So page and a half to go. As if, as if these passages and these, um, com, this, um, com, these consequences that emanate from the relationship of law, freedom and power were not enough, uncomfortable enough, again, in the context of revolutions, we find another issue with power, specifically with, with Kant's suggestion of the violent origin of all political authority. You remember that at the beginning of this talk, I said that um, the notion of power is ambiguous because it can mean force, it can mean coercion, but it can also mean violence. So political authority for Kant, the unity of freedom, law and power seems to come, arise from a sort of black box when he says whether the power, Gewalt, came first and the law only appeared after it, or whether they ought to have followed this order, these are completely futile arguments for people, people that are already subject to civil law and they constitute a menace to the state. Am I right to think that the philosopher of moral and juridical duties and of freedom is saying that de facto power is preferable to anarchy? I don't think this is a, the right conclusion to draw from what I have said so far. So some caveats need to be need to be made. So what I'm going to say in the time that I have left are only but two suggestions of ways we can better understand the fact that on the one hand, Kant understands the importance of power, especially in the light of his assumptions about the fragility 
and proneness to dissolution of all states. And on the other hand, he understands that the abuse of power is as extreme a risk as the problem of its absence. Remember the extremes, the, the two theoretical extremes I've been trying to articulate. So the first suggestion is that we should distinguish in Kant between submission to power as a condition of possibility for the exercise of freedom under law. We have no choice. If we want freedom and law, we must submit. This is sort of the vulgar version of what I just said. His, um, this submission, submission to power, as we just saw, can be violent, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that this is an unavoidable empirical element at the heart of Kant's theory of right. So we should distinguish, as I said, between submission to power and the exercise of political authority, which as we learn in the anthropology passage, requires analytically the presence of the three elements. So the exercise of political authority requires not only freedom and law, but also power. If we take one out, we start having problems. What guarantees the legitimate exercise of power is the presence of precisely law and freedom. So a final suggestion to read some of the difficulties and tensions that we've been discussing so far is also to draw another distinction. And it is a distinction that I've been already talking about in the talk, but I haven't uh, particularly systematized it. I won't do it either, but this is just a suggestion, which is the distinction between the facto and the jure power. Bet that is a distinction that can also be phrased as the distinction between the exercise of legitimacy and the exercise of authority. I'm not sure still about this. So we, we need to think more about phrasing things in this term, but I think the relationship and the balance between these two principles, between legitimacy, authority, de facto, de jure, in Kant is extremely interesting because it allows us to ask questions like the following. What happens when a society is willing to pay a cost by restricting their freedoms for the sake of guaranteeing high levels of security and minimal levels of violence? And this, this reminds me of, of my grandmother. So I remember she told me she lived on, under a very, I would have to say in the light of current event, a very mild dictatorship we had in Venezuela in the 50s. And I remember she said to me, the beauty about living under this president, you know, this, this dictator, is that we didn't have to close our doors at night. Everybody lived with their doors open. And this is, this is exactly what I think she's saying. This point about, you know, a society paying the cost of freedom, high, co high, high cost freedom to, to be given back, maybe, you know, some sort of other value like security and lack of violence. So you have huge amounts of the facto power, very, very low amounts of the jury power. Or for example, another question that arises from the way I've been talking, I think, is a society where the law is legislated by the appropriate legitimate authority. It is very clear who the de jure authority, who, the, yeah, who the de jure, who embodies the de jure power. Yeah, that's the way I want to phrase it. But where the state lacks an effective coercive arm to implement the legislation. And you could think of Ukraine as an example of that right now. We, we know perfectly well where the de jure locus lies, but because of, of, um, of, the, obvious, of the obvious threats, the de, facto government, the de facto power starts to crumble. So opening up this can of worms, what we suddenly have are states that are free, but are politically unstable, and states that are politically stable, but deeply unfree. Another example of this difference between de facto and the jury, and I think it's the point that Kant is getting at, and this is my final point, 
is Venezuela. I'm sorry to mention it again, but it's the country I come from and it, it, it helps to illustrate certain things. So some of you may know that a couple of years ago in 2019, we had an alternative government that questioned the legitimacy of the official government and said, we are the representatives of the de jure legitimacy. Very well. The problem was that it never got it never achieved the de facto power. The de facto power remained with the regime. You could reduce the de facto power to the idea of, of the military. That's a different issue and we can discuss about that. But I think that, um, that Kant, what Kant is saying to us in cases like the example of Ukraine, I put in cases where there is high levels of political stability, but low levels of freedom. And in the case of Venezuela of having the jury, but not the fact of power, Kant, what, the point of Kant in combining power, law and freedom is that he offers us two conclusions. First, the jury power is not enough. And secondly, then in the absence of any of the three elements, law, freedom, and power, any civil condition starts to crumble. And that's what I have uh, prepared for today. And I think I'm on time, so thank you. So thank you very much for this very clear and uh, stimulating talk. Uh, so the floor is now open for questions. We have uh, 15 minutes to discuss the paper. So just please use the raise hand functions here in Zoom to formulate your questions. So uh, Bugra Yasin, yeah. I think your audio is turned off. Yeah. Yeah. So is it okay now? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Romero, for this great talk. Um, it is interesting that our research sort of interests uh, are intersecting um, because I'm also working on um, the legality and the legitimacy issue uh, in Kant's uh, political philosophy. But I would like to ask you a, a question about the issue of uh, anarchy, which uh, you uh, mentioned. And I, will, I would like to uh, sort of recap it at the end of my uh, little uh, comment on, on, on this issue. Um, maybe um, the, the problem, I think, between the legality and legitimacy in Kant's uh, political philosophy also stems from this uh, conflict between morality and politics. Um, and this issue, uh, I think, um, makes, its, uh, makes itself present, not only with respect to legal issues, but also about this um, unsocial sociability, which uh, Kant refers to in his uh, famous idea for a universal a cosmopolitan society with a universal purpose, uh, with a cos cosmopolitan purpose. Uh, in that, um, and also the um, issue raised by um, Kosalek, Reinhard Kosalek, with regard to this crisis, again, between morality and politics, which I think captures this um, sort of um, the problem of indecision and a conflict in a modern society and how this conflict can be um, sort of extrapolated within the context of uh, legal uh, structure of society, I think also emerges as an issue. But uh, let me uh, ask um, the question of uh, anarchy with respect to the um, uh, passage you mentioned from anthropology. Uh, you said that uh, in the absence of law and freedom, that this threat of anarchy emerges in Kant's um, uh, in imaginarium as, a, as this violent uh, possibility of civil war. But also in that passage, he mentions that anarchy refers to a state where law and freedom can exist without de facto power. Uh, and in that respect, I think it is reminiscent of the idea of ethical community which is uh, mentioned in religion within the bounds of mere reason, because it's also interestingly characterized by the lack of coercive power, uh, but it exists uh, as a community in which law and freedom exists without this middle element, uh, as Kant calls, uh, of coercion. So uh, do you think that 
this problem I mentioned between morality and politics uh, finds a different uh, formulation, uh, finds a different solution in this idea of ethical community, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, positioned against uh, all these trappings of political power, authority, uh, legality, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Bura. That, that was really very well presented. And if, if you're working on anything, please email me and, and we, can, yeah. we can expand the conversation. A couple of things. Uh, the first is Kosalek. So just touch a, a, a nerve um, in, in a positive way, because um, I don't know if you know that the critique and crisis in the preface, Kosalek says that he was intending to write a book on Kant. Mm -hmm. And this is the book that, that so critique and crisis is mm -hmm. the book came out of that first intention, I, I find that fascinating, which just comes to confirm that he, he does think that the morality and politics issue, and also this idea of the inner and the outer, mm -hmm. and that, that tension of modernity is certainly operating here in Kant. That's just a general point. Um, a more uh, specific point, I think there is a really strong ambiguity in Kant's notion of power in, in relation to coercion. So as we know for him in the doctrine of right, the idea of right analytically entails the idea of coercion. So there cannot be such thing as law without external coercion. That's why I find very hard to understand how the ethical community can operate. Let me put it this way. The, the notion of law, the combination of law and freedom, that, that, that pair, that law, in the ethical community has to be a different kind of law from law as right, right? Because otherwise there would have to necessarily be the third element of coercion. That's the first thing. So it, an, an interesting question would be, how does Kant understand the legislation of law in the religion? Great question. Or how does Kant understand the legislation of law when there is, an ethical community that has political elements, mm -hmm. right? So this, this, this tension between the two realms. Um, the other point is about anarchy. You said in the absence of law and freedom, anarchy arises. So I theorize anarchy slightly different uh, to the way he, theor he defines it taxonomically in the anthropology. So I, as, as, you, as you rightly mm -hmm. said, and everybody knows in the anthropology, he plays with these three elements. So, you know, when we have law and freedom, we get this. If we take power, we get that. So if we have law and freedom, that's the condition he calls uh, law and freedom without power. That's the condition we call anarchy. I've been in a way trying to say that such a thing that anarchy for Kant is, is a different kind of thing, at least the way he understands it in relation to revolution. So anarchy is the state, that condition of vacuum, of absence of the three elements. So the moment the revolution is inaugurated, and I would love to, to think what my, my colleagues in, in the panel think of this as, um, as sort of post-Kantian thought of this, once revolution has um, started, and up to the point where a new constitution has been established, that vacuum is the absence of the three elements because it's the absence of, of political authority altogether. So a question you leave me and I take and cannot resolve right now is how is this different from the anarchy that he proposed as a, con as a taxonomical condition in the anthropology where he allows for the possibility of a combination of law and freedom without power. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, yes, Karin. Uh, yes, uh, Paula, thanks for this uh, great talk. Uh, as you know, uh, this topic is not a topic I have uh, studied myself. So I'm going to ask a kind of, you know, very simple question. Um, so to me, it's not yet very clear what is so special about Kant's uh, theory and his threefold distinction. Because put very simple, uh, you've got a, a community of free citizens, uh, you've got laws, um, 
the laws by which they need to be governed in order for the community as a whole to function. And so you need um, uh, a force to make sure that the citizens uh, abide by the law. Yes, that the laws are implemented and, and that uh, criminals are, are put in jail. Uh, so I think at this very general level, um, it's it's kind of very plain that you need something, yes, and it's it's nicely um, parallel to the uh, theory of the schematism. Yes, you've got categories, you've got stuff, and you need something mediating that uh, actually has the force to uh, apply. The, the rules that are contained in the categories. And, and is, that, is that reason? What what is in, in the schematism? Or the well, it's the, sch the schemata themselves uh, that's, that allow the, the laws, as it were, to be applied mm -hmm. to, to what is given in sensibility. I see. Yeah. So, so there are, of course, cognitive powers at work. Yes. So let, especially the power of the imagination. Uh, so, so that's another point. Yes, yeah, so that, let's take this as an aside. Yes, that there is this interesting parallel. But, but I think at the general level, I think it is, to me, it's, it seems like very, very self-evident that, that if you have free citizens and you've got laws, then you need a power um, that, 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 that makes sure that the laws are being obeyed. So, and this, I, I, so my question is, well, is this um, a theory that is specific to Khan? Uh, so I, I guess that everyone else had the same view, so that the, so what, so the peculiarity of Khan's position must lie somewhere else, yeah? because I think that, that everyone else at the time would agree that, that laws and and, and free citizens do not suffice to, to keep uh, a nation, um, you know, uh, coherent and, and stable. Yes. Got it. Thank you. Um, I think this, this allows me to, to clarify that um, I, I was not intending to say that the originality of the theory lied in the fact that power was a constitutive element. Um, I guess that, and, and this, this upsets me a little bit because it, it shows to me that this ended up being a reflection of, 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 Kant, of interpretations of Kant and, and not a bigger, a bigger problem about political authority. But Karen, the problem seems to be that the notion has, it hasn't been taken up. And I think, and this had to do with what I said about this overly legalistic yeah. and overly juridical reading yes. of Kant. Yeah. So um, the argument would be, of course, you know, Kant, as anybody, any any political philosopher understands that um, laws in order to be effective need to be, there has to be an, ex and that's the ex executive power, right? The executive power of the sovereign is the one that says, yes, let it, let it be. But um, it seems to me that in, in Kant's, in Kantian studies, because of the importance of keeping the legality and the legitimacy of the state as the most important value, is a, this is my feeling, is as if power, talking of, of that strong hand, will alter or upset or diminish or um, threaten the legitimacy and legality of law. And what I want to say is, as you say, very simple. He sees it as a combination of things. It's not only that what we can we can only have power that will be obviously um, despotism from any point any point of view of any political philosopher. But the point in Kant is that he acknowledges the importance of this element as constitutive. So it's not. I I, fe I fear sometimes that we see laws in Kant as emanating from the trees or from goodwill uh, agents or from um, from very morally. Um, with morally tempered sovereigns, um, and what did, and, and then the, the that was the second, the first argument of the talk, and then sort of the second one was to say, if we really take power into account, then we get a lot of interesting problems that we tend not to see in Kant. Um, 
which is this whole idea that we get, we go, we we stop seeing just juridical conditions and and barbarism. We there's a lot of stuff in between, where these three elements in different combinations will give you free state, free, um, a strong but not free states, free state. That was the thought, but I think that it, it is helpful for me. Um, to clarify very early on that um, what is distinctive of Kant is not the fact that power is part of the combination. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Yes, Pavel. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Just to follow up on the that and the previous question. Um, so there is the, what do you think is the connection between this, this idea that Kant has that um, I think as he puts it in that uh, that universal history essay, so he says something like man is a being in need of a master. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is to be sort of forced by force to be free, um, to be human in a way. Um, so that when you're speaking, and I think that this was mentioned in the first question, that it kind of reminded me of this need for force, reminded me of this idea that Kant has. Um, and that idea is kind of peculiar, or if not peculiar, highly controversial. So. Herder was infuriated by this this uh, position that Kant took on it, for example. So I wonder if there's any connection between power as you portrayed in this context and this idea that Kant has about um, us needing to be sort of morally whipped into uh, into shape. Yes, and and Herder was upset because he thought this was an argument for for like author, uh, authoritarianism or something like that, or or that he. Yeah, I think partly, and partly he thought it didn't make sense that that, that you should be forced to be free because free, being free means not being forced. So, and I, I think that's one. So I think there's that basic sort of logical kind of uh, um, worry, but also I think he thought it as, you know, potentially justifying some kind of tyrant who goes and goes and forces, <laughs> forces you to be free yeah. in that way. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, no, I think that that's interesting. Um, I don't. You you could go you could go a boring line and and be very strict about it and say, well, as as I've said already many times, it's not just power; it's in combination with law and freedom. So you you can sort of save Kant from from the idea that what we require is just. Um, a strong hand, so to speak, because this this element can only work in combination with the other two. But that, those are just words, right? The the real question is, okay, this idea that ma the um, human beings need a master. Of course, that text is is a sort of teleological text. So that's when you get that tension between the teleological writings and and the doctrine of right, because in the doctrine of right, he he's not going to talk about in terms of you know, political authority is sort of instrumentally useful or something that was mentioned by, by Berger before that, um, you know, from bad stuff, good, good stuff might come about. But the fact that because we, you know, because we are externally free, certain things need to be in place. And one of them is, is the state. So that, that, would be, that would be my response in, in the interest of time as well. Yeah, I think in view of the time, uh, Bugre, if you, if it is quick, yeah, yeah, just just, just a quick follow up. Actually, um, in 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 his uh, lectures on uh, Kant, um, Theodore Adorno uh, remarked in Problems of Moral Philosophy oh, yeah. that um, actually when we are sort of approaching Kant's theory, we have to be attuned to uh, contradictions. You know, so I think that is the. Uh, more sort of judicious way of approaching Kant rather than trying to paper over them. Uh, allow, allow the yeah. tensions to breathe. Yeah, exactly. Great, thank you. So I think this is a very nice way of concluding, allowing the text to breathe. And uh, now we can then move on to our second speaker of the day. But first of all, thank you very much for your talk, Paula, and for the discussion. It is uh, very stimulating. Um, so um, our second speaker today is Michael Menz. Uh, he's professor at the University of Maryland, 
Uh, his research deals with social and political philosophy in Kant and post-Kantian German philosophy. He has also related interests in uh, contemporary political uh, philosophy and uh, Frankfurt School social theory. He has published several articles and book chapters, uh, such as uh, Fichte's First Principle of Right uh, in Fichte Studien, uh, 2021, and uh, a chapter on Erhard on revolutionary action uh, in a volume on practical philosophy from Kant to Hegel, recently published by Cambridge University Press. Um, he will give us a talk today on Fichte's early anarchism. So uh, thank you very much, Michael, for uh, being here today. And uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, it's great to uh, talk to you all today. So, uh, my aim in this talk is to examine some of Fichte's arguments about political obligation in his early text. Uh, it's called Contribution to the Correction of, of the Public's Judgment of the French Revolution. It's quite a mouthful. Uh, in that text, he treats political obligation as a species of contractual obligation. And he builds a theory of contractual obligation that takes its inspiration from the little known figure, Theodor Anton Schmaltz. So in the, I'll, I'll start with a passage uh, from Fichte's contribution in which he directly quotes Schmaltz uh, and then says something about Schmaltz's influence. So here's the passage. Uh, according to natural right, I have no perfect right to the truthfulness of the other. If he makes me a disingenuous promise, I cannot complain of harm until he tempts me into his service. So that's Schmaltz uh, in his 1792 text, um, Das reine Naturrecht. Then Fichte comments, uh, he says, he describes him as the most sharp-witted and con consistent teacher of natural right that we've had up to now. The following, and what follows is Fichte's theory of, of contractual obligation, should be regarded as commentary and where necessary as correction of these sentences. So Fichte states here that he regards his account of uh, promise and contractual obligation as commentary on Schmaltz's view. Um, after some reconstruction uh, of the arguments of Fichte and Schmaltz, I'm going to argue that despite Fichte's claim to be merely commenting on and amending Schmaltz's view, uh, he in fact departs quite radically from Schmaltz on a number of fundamental issues. And the result is uh, a philosophical anarchist view of political obligation that's both problematic in itself and also uh, quite distant from anything defended by Schmaltz. Uh, and this is part of a larger, this, I, so I'm trying to bite off a chunk of a bigger project here and kind of present uh, this little, this little uh, moving part today. Okay. So um, before I get to Schmaltz and Fichte, I need to introduce a little background. So. Philosophical anarchism uh, is the view that uh, political obligation, which is understood as uh, the duty to obey political authority, uh, is impossible. Um, and here, obedience means a specific thing. Obedience, as Robert Paul Wolf uh, puts it, is not a matter of doing what someone tells you to do, it's a matter of doing what he tells you to do because he tells you to do it. Uh, so the intuition that drives anarchists like Wolf is that there's a deep and irresolvable tension between the enlightenment ideal that we're, we as rational agents are uniquely responsible for our beliefs and actions and the idea of political obligation, which holds that we can have a duty to obey an authority other than our own conscience. Obedience to another's authority and individual freedom of thought and action uh, are contradictory from this point of view. 
And this is a point that Enlightenment thinkers are happy to accept uh, when it comes to religious authority. Uh, and Wolf, and I'm suggesting Fichte, extend it to political authority as well. OK, so now I need to say something about Fichte's concept of revolution in this early text. Um, it's a rather peculiar concept. So a revolution in Fichte's contribution is the act by which a group of individuals change their constitution. And we can, do, we can analyze this in terms of two distinct, uh, two distinct steps. First, uh, people withdraw their consent to be ruled by a political community. That's secession, as, I, as I'll call it. And second, uh, they voluntarily agree to set up something else in its place, and I call that reconstitution. Each step uh, is supposed to involve the exercise of an, in, an inalienable natural right by individuals acting as individuals. So for Fichte, there's no sense in which a group has or exercises a right. That is Fichte in this early 1793 text. So the right to revolution is thus uh, the individual right to secession and combined with the individual right to reconstitution, which Fichte thinks is just an instance of the individual right to free contract. So when it comes to large scale revolution, like the French Revolution, Fichte just interprets that as a whole bunch of individuals as individuals withdrawing their consent from one regime and then reconstituting themselves under a new one. Uh, and there are various problems with this, including some, some problems noted by Earhart, for example, um, but I'm gonna leave that alone for uh, the time being. So the question for Fichte of the rightfulness of revolution amounts to the question do individuals have the natural right, the inalienable right, to withdraw their consent to an existing state and to redeploy that consent as they see fit? In chapter one of the contribution, Fichte argues for the view that the right to these two acts uh, is in fact uh, an inalienable individual natural right. So first, uh, he argues for a strongly voluntarist account of political obligation. And second, uh, he supplements that argument by additionally arguing against two principles, which I call unchangeability and irrevocability. So uh, against unchangeability, Fichte argues, no one may ever consent to be governed by a static, unchangeable constitution that violates uh, humanity and our own person. And against irrevocability, he argues, no one may give a permanently valid or irrevocable consent. Uh, the, the rights then to revoke one's consent and to change one's constitution turn out to be inalienable rights. Uh, but note that this argument does not show the valid exercise of, of this right to be unconditional or arbitrary. Perhaps, as seems plausible, and as Earhart, for example, holds, one may exercise this inalienable right to change one's constitution only uh, under certain conditions when the state engages in certain kinds of egregious wrongs. And otherwise, one remains obligated to obedience. So this argument is, as far as I can tell, consistent with the possibility of political obligation. So at this point in the text, Fichte seems to regard his argument as basically concluded. Um, but then he strangely goes on to give an argument that entails a stronger claim, namely that the very idea of political obligation itself is contrary to human freedom and thus has no rightful validity. Now, if that argument's right, then it seems there's no need to argue for a right to secession, for there's no valid political obligation in the first place that would bind you to your existing state. 
It doesn't appear from the text of the contribution that Fichte recognizes that the second argument he gives is considerably stronger than the first. He sort of runs them together. Instead, the dialectic of his text goes like this. He argues first for the inalienable natural right to secession and reconstitution. Then he considers some objections to that argument. And third, in responding to those objections, he introduces a new doctrine of contractual obligation. And that's where he draws on Schmaltz. Uh, but this new account, I want to suggest, uh, in a sense, negates the point of the original argument that he gave in the first step, because it turns out to entail a stronger claim. What I want to do in the rest of my short, uh, short remarks is look closely here at step three in this dialectic, Fichte's use of schmaltz to develop his anarchist view about uh, contractual obligation. So as we've already noted, Fichte explicitly states that he's inspired by Schmaltz, uh, but his revisions of Schmaltz's framework uh, are in fact quite major. So what I'll do to demonstrate that is I'll first uh, sketch Schmaltz's views about promise, contract, and right. Uh, then I'll reconstruct uh, Fichte's views about the same topics, and I'll conclude by commenting on the, the major differences between the views. So what is Schmaltz's view about promise, contract, and natural right? Well, first, uh, let's look at the view that was quoted by Fichte with approval. So Schmaltz writes, uh, according to uh, natural right, I have no perfect right, no perfect right to the truthfulness of the other. So according to Schmaltz, uh, natural rights are the rights that correspond to perfect external moral duties. Perfect, ex, so external moral duties for Schmaltz are duties to others. So we have perfect duties to others in the Kantian framework. Um, and all and only such duties generate corresponding rights claims on behalf of others, according to Schmaltz. So if there's no general external perfect duty of truthfulness, it follows that there's no natural right that others should always tell one the truth. You have no claim against others that they should always tell the truth. And I'll just note uh, that Schmaltz, Fichte, and Kant all sensibly deny that there's a perfect duty of truthfulness. Okay, uh, so they didn't. So they they accept uh, the third point here that there's no general. Uh, duty of truthfulness that generates a right on others' behalf to demand that one tell the truth. So Kant makes this point very explicitly in the Doctrine of Right. So he writes, uh, innate right includes the authorization, quote, to do to others anything that does not in itself diminish what is theirs, so long as they do not want to accept it such things as merely communicating one's thoughts to them, telling or promising them something, whether what, what one says is true and sincere or untrue and insincere, for it's entirely up to them whether they want to believe one or not. So Kant uh, shares this view. And then lastly, before moving on, I want to note that for Schmaltz, this is not to say that there's no duty of truthfulness. In fact, Schmaltz says there is a duty of truthfulness, but it belongs to morality and not to natural right, because it's an internal duty in his framework, which is a duty to self. And duties to self generate no corresponding claim rights on the part of anyone else. So for Schmaltz, I do owe it to myself to be truthful, and I owe it to myself to keep my promises, but nobody has the right to demand that from me. Uh, I'm going to skip that one. So Schmaltz's second claim uh, that's important for our purposes. Well, it concerns the nature of promises. 
A contemporary author, Peter Valentine, distinguishes between moralized and non-moralized accounts of promising. And, I'll, and, and Fichte and Schmaltz and Kant all analyze contract as reciprocal promise. So the, the moralized, non-moralized distinction regarding promise uh, can also underwrites a moralized, non-moralized distinction regarding contract. So for Valentine, on a moralized account, a promise that's validly made and validly accepted generates a moral obligation for the promiser as a matter of definition or conceptual necessity. There's no conceptual space on that kind of account to ask whether one is morally obligated to keep one's promise. If there's a promise, then you're by definition, morally obligated to keep it. The only question is whether a purported instance of promising, uh, in fact, meets the normative requirements of the account, such that it actually generates a moral claim and a moral obligation. So the way Valentine puts it is he says, on a moralized account, the question isn't whether promises are binding, it's whether there are any promises. Uh, yeah. Non-moralized accounts, by contrast, start with a non-moral concept of promising, which you could think of as more of a sociological conception. So for example, a non-moralized account might hold that promising involves A's asserting her intention to phi and inviting B to rely upon that intention and B accepting A's assertion and invitation. So an account like that picks out a particular social phenomenon in the world. And if the account's conditions are met, uh, we have a promise, but the account itself doesn't answer the question, if those things have happened, is A obligated to keep their promise to B or not? That's an open question from the standpoint of a non-moralized account of promising. All right. So Schmaltz, uh, I want to say, has a non-moralized account of promise. Um, and I'll just, it's not a very good account, actually. Uh, his analysis of promising is like uh, not particularly convincing, but that's neither here nor there for my purposes. The point that I want to make is just that he's making a certain type of argument. So um, according to Schmaltz, uh, promising involves simply, uh, quote, the declaration of our will to want to perform something for someone. Now that's not sufficient to capture our ordinary intuitive concept of promising, uh, but Schmaltz does follow up with the claim, uh, with two claims that first, the accepting of a promise means the declaration of our will to let the promised performance happen to us and a person's promise and the corresponding acceptance uh, are called contract. Although I think probably we would usually reserve the term contract for what Schmaltz calls reciprocal promise where there's a, a, a promise going both ways with, with uptake. So in Schmaltz's terms, what we ordinarily would call a promise is, is a contract, and what uh, we ordinarily would call a contract is a reciprocal promise or a reciprocal contract. The important point is that given Schmaltz's non-moralized conception, uh, it's an open question for him whether the accepting of a promise grants me an external perfect right to the other's performance of their, of their side of the deal. That is, whether an enforceable moral claim to the promiser's performance follows from the mere offering and acceptance of the promise. And what's interesting about Schmaltz's account is this third point, which is actually, he says, uh, there is no contractual obligation 
to perform unless and until the other party actually performs their side of the contract. Mere agreement for Schmaltz does not generate obligation. Only one party actually delivering the goods uh, suffices. So why? Well, Schmaltz uh, has an argument, I think. And it has to do with uh, what he calls original rights, urrechte. So for Schmaltz, who is a broadly, I mean, he's a sort of synthesis of Kant and Locke, basically. And this is a Lockean component of his view. Um, he says there are three original rights, uh, a right to oneself, a right to one's actions, and a right to the use of things. And when we acquire, uh, I mean, so this is roughly self-ownership uh, in something like Locke's sense. When we acquire a new right to a thing or to uh, a service by a contract, something new gets, in Schmaltz's words, connected to our original right. And the way that this happens is through uh, formation. This is another sort of Lockean position. So uh, Schmaltz writes, uh, there's no property except through such a connection of the object to our original right. Only in this way can we resolve the problem of how the human being uh, can begin to form a relationship with the things around him as if they belonged to his essence. So this is the problem of how we extend our agency out into the world. Indeed, through acquisition, a part of his essence is imparted, as it were, on the things. So that sounds like Locke's labor mixing view. So in transfer via contract, two things happen. First, one party alienates a thing. Uh, and, and second, the second party acquires the thing by forming it with their will imparting part of their essence on the newly acquired thing. And this, I take it, this is my interpre interpretive hypothesis, explains why the mere agreement to transfer person A's property to person B is not yet B's actual acquisition of the new item of property. B has to actually form the thing to attach it to B's original right, and agreeing to form it is not the same thing as actually forming it. So Schmaltz's view then is that only the one party's actual transfer of what's owed to the other party suffices to generate uh, obligation for reciprocal performance. Although of course you do owe it to yourself uh, as a matter of internal duty uh, to do what you say you were going to do. Okay. So uh, let's have a look at Fichte's views about these things. So um, on the first issue, Fichte agrees with Schmaltz that there's no general external perfect duty to tell the truth. And he further agrees with Schmaltz, I think that there is an internal perfect duty of truthfulness, although it's a sort of strange, his take on what that involves is a bit strange and I can say more about it um, if anybody is interested. Um, So Fichte and Schmaltz agree regarding the first issue. But on the second issue, uh, Fichte and Schmaltz part ways in a quite emphatic way. Um, and Fichte doesn't seem to realize that he is parting ways with Schmaltz. So Fichte holds a moralized conception of contract. For Fichte, unlike for Schmaltz, Promises and contracts are not empirically given. Rather, they're epistemically problematic up to the point where both parties actually perform at like until the contract is done, is accomplished, right? 
uh, only God knows if there is one. So here's what Fichte writes. He says, both are sincere in the hour of their promise. There's a contract between them. They go forth in one of the two or both reconsider and in their hearts take back their will. The contract is repealed. The promises are undone because right and obligation are repealed. No being knows whether a contract really exists or not, except for the one that constitutes the common inner tribunal for both, namely God. So according to Fichte's theory here, the existence of a contract depends on the sincere willing of the terms of the agreement by both of the contracting parties. If at any moment prior to the actual exchange stipulated by the agreement, one of the other parties ceases to will to carry out the transfer required by the contract, then at that moment, there is no contract anymore and neither party has any contractual obligation to the other. Although, well, one party may owe the other damages, uh, but I'll, I'm not going to get into that right now. Um, if one or both parties never had any intention of performing their contractual duty, then no contract ever existed in the first place, appearances to the contrary notwithstanding. So whereas for Schmaltz, uh, contracts are a sociological phenomenon that can be empirically observed, for Fichte, they are always and necessarily problematic right up to their realization up to reciprocal performance of all parties to the contract. So big departure uh, regarding that claim. And on the third issue too, Fichte departs from Schmaltz. So um, for Schmaltz, the other's acceptance of my promised performance. So, you know, I, I say, I'll sell you my bike for $25 and you say, sure. Um, but we don't actually exchange the goods. For Schmaltz, the other's acceptance of my promised performance doesn't suffice to generate a new claim right on their part, uh, but their actual performance of their end of the deal does suffice. Fichte wants to extend Schmaltz's reasoning about the acceptance of a promise by, and ask the further question, well, if the promisee's acceptance doesn't obligate the promiser, why should the promisee's actual performance obligate the promiser? And what Fichte is seizing on here in Schmaltz's account is Schmaltz's question. Uh, Schmaltz writes, um, in rejecting the idea that one party's acceptance of another's promise produces an obligation, Schmaltz writes, my will can surely not impose a law on someone else. My will can surely not impose a law on someone else. So my accepting of the offer can't impose a law on your will. Now, the sense that Fichte attaches to this statement, uh, which I think is not what Schmaltz intends, but Fichte's interpretation is that allowing your acceptance of my promise to bind me to perform would amount to accepting a heteronymous source of obligation. To be more precise, this is my interpretive hypothesis of where Fichte thinks he's getting these views in Schmaltz. He understands Schmaltz to have reasoned as follows. Uh, contract right is governed not by unconditional commands of the moral law, but solely by one's arbitrary will in the space of what's morally merely permitted. In that space, to allow another person's acceptance of my promise to bind my will would allow my will to be bound by a foreign will. But according to Fichte, a foreign will never binds, and therefore the other person's acceptance doesn't bind my arbitrary will. 
So this is what Fichte thinks Schmaltz is suggesting. And then Fichte says, well, why not apply parallel reasoning to the question of the other's actual performance? So we can run the same argument, just replacing acceptance with performance. So contract right is governed not by unconditional commands of the moral law, but solely by one's arbitrary will. To allow another person's performance to bind my will would be to allow a foreign will to bind it, bind my, my will, but a foreign will never binds, as Fichte puts it. Therefore, the other person's performance does not bind my arbitrary will. Fichte thus arrives uh, by what he takes to be broadly Schmaltzian views uh, at the view that only mutual performance, the completion of a contract, shows that there was a valid contract at all. So you only know if there was obligation retrospectively, because only at the completion of the reciprocal uh, performance does something new get attached to the party's original rights. But I'll note that Schmaltz's argument for his third claim, which we discussed above, which had to do with how things get connected to your original rights, uh, doesn't actually rely on the premises that Fichte is using here. Right? So I think he just gets Schmaltz's view wrong, as far as I can tell. And the resulting view is um, the dissolution of contractual obligation effectively. So on Fichte's analysis, uh, if we divide the time between the initial agreement of a contract at T1 and the actual performance of the parties at T2 into a set of discrete moments, then at each moment, between T1 and T2, the parties to the contract are in exactly the same normative position that they were at T1. They're constantly choosing whether to reauthorize the contract. And at every point within this span, it's within the power of the individual's own arbitrary will to cancel their obligation to perform. And nothing anyone else does has any impact on that power. So in effect, I want to say this dissolves the whole idea of contractual obligation. And since Fichte sees political obligation as a species of contractual obligation, it dissolves political obligation too. And interestingly, the contemporary author, uh, John Simmons, who's criticizing the philosophical anarchism of Robert Paul Wolf, here's, what it, here's one of the arguments that he makes. He says, a fully voluntary, genuinely contractual democracy could be rejected on voluntarist grounds only if the voluntarist anarchist was also prepared to deny the legitimacy of the ordinary practice of promising. On the ground, say, that promissory obligations objectionably constrain freedom despite their being freely undertaken. This seems too high a price to pay. But I'll just note uh, so this is from a 2001 book in which Simmons is criticizing Robert Paul Wolf's 1970 view, I think. Uh, but actually, this is precisely what Fichte does. Uh, he pays the price of dissolving ordinary promissory and contractual obligation uh, because they objectionably constrain freedom. So for Schmaltz, uh, political obligation occurs via social contract. The social contract becomes fully binding once any of its uh, signatories perform. Uh, and political obligation, oh, yeah. yeah, OK, I'll finish up. Uh, so Fichte's theory entails that civil society is an ongoing voluntary association uh, between people who are uh, as free to opt out at any point as they were to join in the first place and who have no contractual obligation to each other at all. So a consequence of Fichte's view 
is that the idea of a central legal authority dissolves into the anarchist ideal of a social and political organization based around ongoing, strictly voluntary associations. And uh, the last thing I'll say is that uh, this is a very different view from anything endorsed by Schmaltz, in addition to it being uh, a deeply problematic view in a lot of ways. Um, and it's a stronger view than is required for the main conclusions that Fichte wants to argue for in chapter one of his contribution. So uh, thanks, and sorry I went over just a bit on time. No problem, thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you for this uh, very rich talk. And um, now we have time for questions. So just uh, use the raise hand functions to, uh, to formulate your questions. Uh, and... And if the, oh yeah, uh, James. Uh, the, the audio is off. The, uh, James, yeah. I like that again. <laughs> yeah, Thanks yeah. Very, thank you very much, Mike. That was a really, really fascinating paper. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wonder how this relates to Earhart's critique of Fichte and whether, because, I mean, Earhart thought is that Fichte's account just dissolves all obligation, doesn't it? And really, it just hinges an arbitrary will. So is where you've arrived kind of constant with Earhart's critique? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is one. So there are a number of, um, of uh, criticisms of these arguments that were published. Uh, so the Fichte published this, this pamphlet anonymously in 1793. In 1794, I think both uh, Gentz and Erhard uh, publish reviews. Erhard's uh, review is much longer and more thorough. Um, yeah, and I mean, uh, nobody was convinced by this view ab about, about contract. Um, it effectively, I mean, it's obviously uh, a view that is sufficient to entail the conclusion that Fichte wants to entail, which is that the French revolutionaries didn't do anything wrong, um, right? But as, as Simmons has it, it's a very high price to pay. And so I think it's Gentz, I can't remember exactly what Earhart says about this. I think Gentz's view as well, you basically just uh, gave up on the possibility of social cooperation and sort of the goods of um, the goods that become possible when we're able to rely on each other to keep our agreements, right? Um, which of course, you know, that's a point already in Hobbes. Uh, so I can't remember, I think, I think uh, Earhart does have this, makes a version of this argument that, that uh, this just dissolves the notion of contractual obligation um, altogether. Uh, so yeah, I think it's. I think what I'm saying here is, is, is a version of the Earhart type critique. Is does that sound right to you? It does. It sounds similar. Yeah, it does. Yeah. I mean, Earhart just thinks that Victor Siri makes a nonsense of contractual obligation. Yeah. Which is basically yeah. the way you go on with that. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, Pavel. Sorry. Uh, thanks for that. So just to, I think I missed a part at the beginning. Um, you said, or related to your title, you said this is Fichte's early anarchism. Um, does he, so he, he retracts this view and does his, does he realize the, the problems that you kind of um, mentioned just now, or does he, is there more sort of, uh, I don't know, wholesale change with respect to his view of revolution? Um, so um, I don't have a fully worked out answer to that question, but I am working on it. Um, and I think it's a very, basically that's what this 
for for me this series this exchange um is of interest insofar as it sets up a certain developmental trajectory for Fichte's political thought. So I'll say like something that's kind of tentative about what I think is going on developmentally and how these views sort of carry over. Um, so I do think that Fichte maintains the strong voluntarism I think that's a core commitment of his that lasts at least through 1800. Um, uh, I think that he becomes troubled that his view, in a, in a sense, um, the inability for people in, according to the 1793 view, the inability of people to bind themselves over time leads, I, I mean, the integrity of human agency almost crumbles if we can't, if what I say at T1 doesn't constrain me at T2, right? And I think Fichte realizes this and if you if you go back and carefully read foundations of natural right these concerns about um consent and uh this and consistency and this diachronic structure of rationality and action are pervasive uh in the book and i think it's because he's trying to work out in some way, how to have some for some weaker form of anarchism, um, and still hold, uh, still allow temporally extended uh, principled human agency to exist. Um, I don't know. Does that does that help at all? Yeah, yeah, that does. Though, is it possible to have any kind of anarchism in how you defined it and still? I mean, do, do you think that it is possible to, to combine those two? Well, certainly not the certainly not the very strong form that I mean the 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 seventeen ninety three version is like maximalist, right? Um, it says a priori there could not possibly be any political obligation because it would contradict human freedom, right? Um, so I think that he wants to relax uh, that claim, but I do think, I mean, in the later work, he refers to actually existing states as, uh, as Notstata, so states of, the states of necessity or as, as I think um, Brazil and Zilla translated um, makeshift states, which I actually kind of like. Um, and I think there is in the later Fichte this sense that you're not, at, there isn't really political obligation in the sense that you're not living in a right, in, in a rightful condition that suffices to obligate you uh, because it doesn't fully recognize your personhood in terms of Fichte's logic of recognition. Um, but we are obligated to sort of make do and make believe, if you will, um, that the state that we live in, we, we're supposed to act like it has uh, authority over us, over us, even if it doesn't uh, actually meet those meet those conditions. So I do think there's a carryover uh, of the kind of anarchist ideals in that sense into the later work. Uh, thanks. And I don't know if uh, yeah, Henny. Thank you. I have an 
a bit of a more general question, which personally interests me, is um, if you can make sense of Fichte's claim that um, the revolution um, or his thoughts on the revolution provided the first hints for his uh, Wissenschaftslehre of 94. Do you, do you see that or, and, and how do you see it? It provided, provided what, what, sorry? Well, you, Fichte later declared that his thoughts on the revolution also provided him with, um, let's say, the, the first ideas, the first hints, um, first insights about what was to become his Wissenschaftslehre of um, 1794. And um, I think it's difficult to, to make a connection, but some scholars have, have said there is one. And I, I wanted to know what is your viewpoint on that uh, is. Yeah. Yeah, I think something like that is uh, is important to Fichte actually. Um, aside from, I mean, I can say a sort of somewhat vague and general thing about what I think he's thinking, um, which is that uh, the revolution is for him, um, the, it's the self, it's self, it's the self positing of the human spirit, uh, in history, right? It's, it's the, the eye posits itself schlecht hin, right? Um, and in the same or in an analogous sense in the revolution, um, human beings are sort of making themselves up from scratch in some sense, uh, according to this, uh, according to the structure of reason and not according to the structure that's given to them, uh, in history. And I think he takes that, I think he takes that quite seriously. Um, now that's only that's only like a metaphor, right? Uh, and I don't know exactly if you can uh, deepen that metaphor and make it richer. Uh, I don't. I don't know. It's an interesting project, right? But but if I had to guess, I would say that's what he thinks when he writes that. Very nice. Uh, and I think on that note, we can uh, bring this discussion to an end. So thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation and for the discussion. And it was very nice, very uh, stimulating. And uh, so now we will move on to our third and, uh, and final speaker. Uh, James Clark. Um, he's a, a senior lecturer at the University of York, and uh, his research interests are in both Kantian practical philosophy, especially Erhard Fichte and Hegel, uh, Rousseau's moral psychology and political philosophy, and uh, contemporary critical theory. So he also published several articles, uh, such as an, an introduction to Earhart's Devil's Apology uh, in the British Journal for the History of Philosophy in, 2000, in 2018, um, a book chapter on Fichte's in the independence thesis in a, in a critical guide to Fichte's Foundations of Natural Right, published by Cambridge University Press in 2016. And, uh, and he's currently translating, together with Michael Nance, uh, Erhard's writings on revolution for Oxford University Press. Um, he will then present us today a paper on Erhard uh, on natural law and revolution. So uh, thank you very much for being here today, James. And uh, please, the, the floor is yours. Thanks for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, Okay, so in this paper, I'm going to try and make sense of Earhart's account of natural law theory and revolution. And I'm going to try and understand Earhart's 
position as responding to the tradition of natural law theory and developing an account of revolution based on that. So I'm gonna start by saying something about natural law theory, and then I'm going to move to talking about the positions of Aquinas, Wolf and Achenval, and then I'm gonna say something about Earhart's own position. Okay, so we're gonna start with natural law theory. So natural law theorists distinguish between natural law on the one hand and positive law on the other. A natural law denotes a set of moral or rational norms or standards that are universal and context transcendent, holding for all societies and states. And they're usually held in the tradition to be derived from the commands of God or to be identical with them. And positive law, by contrast, denotes the laws and legal political institutions that are authoritatively laid down, established or posited by human beings. And these would be the laws of historically existing societies and states. So positive law include political institutions, political principles and governments. Now, natural law theorists are committed to the thesis that conformity with the standards of natural law is criterial for legal validity. So that a positive law that failed to satisfy the standards of natural law would in some sense not be a law. And I say in some sense because there are different interpretations of this thesis which vary in strength. And this thesis is traditionally associated with the slogan, lex injusta non est lex, an unjust law is no law at all. Now, natural law theorists are also committed to the thesis that the legitimacy of legal political institutions and hence the obligation to obey them is dependent on their conformity with the standards of natural law. And that where there is a conflict between the requirements of natural law and positive law, natural law should trump or override the requirements of positive law. And this is usually associated with Acts 529, one ought to obey God rather than human beings. Now it's sometimes held in the literature, there's a kind of standard textbook worry that natural law theory is excessively congenial to revolutionary politics. And then actually, Kelston has pointed out that the same could be said about conservatism. We'll focus on the claim it's excessively congenial to revolutionary politics. So the idea is that the thought that positive laws and legal political institutions must be answerable to morality seems at first blush to provide a justification for disobeying unjust laws and for overthrowing unjust states. So the thought is there are very many unjust laws and if these aren't laws at all then surely we are relieved from an obligation to obey them and may even have an oblig obligation to overthrow unjust governments. And that, it's sometimes thought, opens the door wide to anarchy and revolution. However, natural law theorists have typically adopted a much more nuanced approach to this, and they have tended to argue that there are very powerful moral considerations that limit and constrain disobedience and resistance. And these are usually held to derive from the requirements of natural law. Okay, so I'm going to start now talking now about Aquinas and then I'll move on to Wolf and Achenval. So the locus classicus for discussions of obedience and rebellion in the natural law tradition is, of course, the work of Aquinas. In Summa Theologiae, Aquinas considers whether we ever have an obligation to obey unjust laws. And he draws a distinction between two kinds of unjust law. Some unjust laws conflict directly with God's commandments by requiring or authorizing us to do things that we should morally never do, things such as, for example, rape, theft, and infanticide. Aquinas, Aquinas says that such laws are not binding in conscience and it is, quote, never permissible to obey them since, and here he cites Acts 5.29, we ought to obey God rather than human beings. Now these unjust laws are to be distinguished from unjust laws that involve the abuse of political authority or the unjust and oppressive treatment of citizens. 
And Aquinas says the latter kind of laws are really acts of violence rather than laws, since, and he cites Augustine here, unjust laws don't seem to be laws. By the way, can everyone hear me okay? Because I'm conscious. Yes, yes, yes. Is that all right? Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, we might think we'd never have an obligation to obey these laws, these laws which involve the unjust treatment of citizens. But this is not Aquinas's view. He claims that we may disobey such laws only if we can do so without giving scandal, by which he means setting a morally corrosive example for others or causing greater harm. If this isn't possible, if resistance would be likely to cause what he calls scandal or disorder, and the Latin is tabatio, which is sometimes translated as civil unrest, then we have an obligation to yield even our rights. And we can take solace in the thought we've done the right thing before God. Now, similar considerations inform Aquinas' position on the moral permissibility of rebellion. In Summa Theologiae, Aquinas holds that tyrannicide and rebellion are in principle permissible as responses to tyrannical rule. However, he adds a crucial caveat, namely, if one feared that disturbing a tyrant's rule would lead to serious disorder and to citizens suffering greater harm than they currently suffer, one would have a moral obligation to acquiesce. And the only permissible form of resistance would be passive disobedience. Now, as John Finnis has pointed out, since the effects of rebellions or revolutions are A, often highly unpredictable, and B, often highly deleterious to individuals, and social institutions, there seems to be a very strong presumption against rebellion. So although Aquinas leaves room for the permissibility of rebellion, when we take into account his worries about this order or tabatio, there seems to be a very strong presumption against rebellion. Okay, so that's Aquinas. I'm gonna turn now to Wolf and Achenval and this is territory, this is kind of terra incognita for me, so I'm sort of finding my way through it. And I've relied on Rydal Malik's very good paper on theories of resistance in the German Enlightenment. So Wolf and Achenwald both endorse perfectionist consequentialism, as Malik points out. They hold that the purpose of the political community and the justification of political authority is the pursuit of happiness and perfection. And this pursuit is, of course, ordained by natural law. They conceive of societies originating in a pact or contract of union between heads of families, who then transfer authority to rulers through a pact of subjection. And these contracts, they claim, engender the basic laws, the Grundgesetze or Leges Fundamentales of a polity. And these basic laws are the ultimate principles that govern the political community, determine the nature and structure of government, and guide the pursuit of the common good. And the basic laws are really fundamental positive laws that are supposed to embody and satisfy the requirements of natural law. Now, in his book on the principles of natural law and the right of peoples, Wolf argues that a people must in normal circumstances, obey a sovereign who governs badly. And that although individual citizens might petition a sovereign if they suffer an injustice, they must patiently suffer if that petition should prove unsuccessful. However, he makes two claims. First, he claims it's permissible to disobey the sovereign if he commands something that conflicts with the basic law. And secondly, he argues that it's permissible to resist the sovereign and to rein him in or hold him in check if he infringes on the right of the people as a whole or the most noble or eminent people, Defoe Namesten. And I assume that Defoe Namesten refers to a specific social group that possesses a certain social status and attendant rights and privileges. So something like the nobility. So in the case where the acts of the government or sovereign infringe upon the right of the people as a whole, or the most noble or eminent people within the community, then we have a right to hold in check or restrain sovereign. 
Now, as Malik has pointed out, it's not clear what such reigning in might involve, and it seems to fall well short of revolution. But Malik has argued that Wolf's commitment to a right of revolution is discernible in a later paragraph, paragraph 1081, in which Erhard discusses the conditions under which a king can lose authority. So Malik seems implicit there is something like a full-blown right to revolution. And I think Christoph Link says that, in other words, Wolf is more explicit about this. Now, Akinval, in his textbook on natural law, explicitly defends a right to revolution. And this is, of course, a position that Kant objects to. He argues, and he draws a distinction between the case in which individual citizens are wronged and, places in which group, and cases in which groups are wronged. So he argues that an individual citizen who believes himself to be wronged by the sovereign is under an obligation to, quote, abstain from all violent pursuit of his right against the public overlord, end quote. This is so because the individual is obligated by the pact of union not to disturb public tranquility. I think there's an obvious echo here of Aquinas' appeal to the dangers of Tabatio. The individual who believes himself to be wronged is permitted to humbly petition the overlord or his representatives, but he may not rebel or revolt. But things are quite different, however, in the case in which the overlord infringes the right of the people as a whole, or an eminent or distinguished part of the people, pars populi in signis. And I suspect that this is equivalent to Wolf's notion of the most noble or eminent people in the community, die Vornehmstern, and thus refers to a specific social group. Now, in this case, the case where the community as a whole or an eminent part of it is wronged and their rights infringed, the people should first seek redress by nonviolent means, petitioning the sovereign or his representatives. But if that fails, they are permitted to revolt on one condition, namely, quote, if the overlord sinks to such a degree of wrongs that the danger threatening the Republic from his continued and tolerated injustice exceeds the danger that is to be feared from the people's taking up arms against him. So just to repeat, the people are permitted, if all petition fails, to revolt only if the overlord sinks to such a degree of wrongs that the danger threatening the Republic from his continued and tolerated injustice exceeds the danger that is to be feared from the people's taking of arms against him. So we have to weigh at the costs of revolutionary action. Okay, so having discussed the views of Aquinas, Wolf and Achenbaugh, I want to turn to Erhardt's position. Erhardt is very clearly influenced by the tradition, I think, but he develops a natural law theory that critically criticizes it and which seeks to go beyond it. So Erhardt rejects the consequentialist and perfectionist conception of natural law endorsed by Golf and Achenval. Whether or not Aquinas is a consequentialist or as it's usually termed a proportionalist is very debatable. Erhardt seeks to develop a critical natural law theory that draws upon Kant's practical philosophy. He conceives of the standards of natural law in terms of human rights, and he derives human rights as necessary conditions of personality, Persönlichkeit, which he defines as a capacity for self-determination in accordance with maxims or self-determination on the basis of insight. Erhardt holds that personality has a special value and dignity which he associates with humanity, Menschheit. According to Erhard, natural law requires that the government recognize the human rights of its citizens. He writes, the recognition of human rights is the necessary condition of the moral validity of a legislation. Should the government fail to recognize human rights, it should be declared immoral and legislation should lose or forfeit its dignity. Now, clearly, if government is to be judged by the standards of natural law, Erhardt has to provide 
some account of what a government is, of its structure and nature. And he does this. Earhart conceives of a government as an hierarchical structure consisting of three levels. So it's a kind of top-down hierarchical structure with the most fundamental level on the top. The first most fundamental level is the level of the basic laws, Grundgesetze, which is also called by Erhardt the basic constitution. The second level is that of the constitution, which presumably lays out the rules that regulate the various institutions of the state. Erhardt doesn't say much about it. And the third and least fundamental or lowest level is the administration or government in the narrow sense, which includes the executive and governmental agencies. Each level is supposed to constrain and regulate the level or levels that are subordinate to it. Thus the basic laws are supposed to constrain and regulate the constitution, and the constitution is supposed to constrain and regulate the activities of the administration and of governmental agencies. Now, the notion of the basic laws is familiar to us from Wolf and Achenval. But Erhardt's conception of them is, I think, rather different and has important implications for his account of revolution. Unlike Wolf and Achenval, Erhardt does not think that the basic laws are contractually grounded. Indeed, Erhardt rejects the idea that civil societies arose historically from contracts or pacts. He holds instead that civil societies emerged through an act of arrogation in which a group appropriates authority and imposes civil orders on other members of society. And in a revolution, he identifies this group as das Vornehmen, the nobility or as it's sometimes translated, the quality. Because Erhardt thinks that civil societies arose through an act of arrogation, effectively a kind of power grab, he thinks that their basic laws has often served to codify and justify relations of domination, justifying them by conferring a specious legitimacy on them. And I think this echoes Rousseau's position in the second discourse. Now, Earhart discusses several features of the basic laws, but for our purposes, two are relevant. First, the basic laws determine the fundamental legal rights of citizens within a state which Earhart calls constitutional rights. These rights are not necessarily egalitarian in nature and might confer radically unequal statuses on citizens as in the case of feudalism. So Earhart talks about the inhuman rights of life Eigenschaft, of serfdom. Secondly, the basic laws possess ultimate positive legal authority. They are the most fundamental public norms within a society and they cannot be criticized, corrected, or revised by appealing to a more fundamental stratum of positive legal norms. Of course, they can be criticized by appealing to natural law, and therein lies the strength of the natural law position. The basic laws are the normative bedrock of society, and they constitute the horizon within which actions are judged to be right or wrong, legitimate or illegitimate. Okay, so I'm gonna turn now to Earhart's concept of revolution, and then I'll try and say a little bit about his justification of revolution. So I think that Earhart's conception of revolution can be elucidated by briefly considering how it differs from the conceptions of revolution of Wolf and Achenval. So firstly, unlike Achenval and Wolf, Earhart does not think of revolution in terms of the violation of a pact or contract of subjection. And I just think this falls out of his anti-contractualism. Secondly, Earhart does not think of revolution. I'm not sure about this, but I think Earhart does not think of revolution as aimed primarily at the overthrow of a tyrannical ruler or regime, although it will almost inevitably involve that. The proper aim and object of revolutionary action is the transformation of the basic laws of the society. As Earhart puts it, an alteration of the basic laws is what one generally calls a revolution. And I think this in a way has to do with the fact that he doesn't think that the problem is with a pact between the people and the sovereign. It's actually the problem is with the basic laws in society. That's what necessitates revolution. 
And then finally, Volkan Appenthal both think that active resistance or revolution may be justified if the rights of an eminent or noble part of the people are infringed. Earhart thinks that revolution arises from a struggle between the people, das Volk, and the eminent part of the people, and that it entails the abolition of the rights and privileges of the latter. So on his account, we have a kind of class struggle, for want of a better term, between the people on the one hand and the nobility or the quality on the other. Okay, so I'm going to turn now in closing to talk about Earhart's justification of revolution. Now, Earhart develops his justification of the moral rights revolution by considering an argument that purports to show revolution is morally impermissible. And this argument, which he attributes to the opponents of revolution, builds and draws upon natural law theory. And Earhart presumably thinks that this argument poses insuperable difficulties for the justifications of revolution provided by other natural law theorists. And that only his position can respond to it. The argument concedes that there are natural laws and that in cases of conflict between natural law and positive law, we should, quote, obey God rather than human beings. But the argument denies that a citizen could ever be morally permitted to engage in revolution. And there are two strands to the argument. So the first strand focuses on the danger of civil disorder. It envisages a scenario in which a citizen seeks to initiate a revolution in response to an injustice he has suffered. Now, given that the citizen can be expected to have reflected upon and as a morally responsible agent should have reflected upon the possible outcomes of his action, he will know that it is highly probable that revolution will lead to, quote, the insecurity of civil existence, as Aquinas calls Tabatio. But this means that he knowingly exposes his fellow citizens, many of whom will be innocent, to serious and disproportionate harm. And for this reason, the argument runs, his action is morally permissible. So the upshot of this is that although a citizen who suffers injustice is morally permitted to passively resist or seek legal redress, he is not permitted to initiate a revolution. Now, it might, of course, be objected that in some cases, the injustices perpetrated by the government might be so severe as to warrant revolutionary action and its attendant risks. For in such cases, nothing could be worse than the prevailing situation. And this, I take it, is the scenario envisaged by Achenwald. But the obvious response to this objection is that we have no way of knowing this. Life under an unjust or despotic government may be intolerable, but the anarchy unleashed by revolutionary action might be far worse. Moreover, if a revolution were to fail, it's highly likely that unjust or despotic rule would be intensified. And this is precisely the argument you find in Aquinas's De Regna. There he's very skeptical about revolution. The counter-revolutionaries supplement this with a second strand of argument, which focuses on the fact that the individual who seeks to initiate revolution does so in response to injustice that he has experienced. They argue that although the individual may act in good faith, it is possible that he's motivated by self-interest, by fear of the harm that threatens him, him personally, even if he came, claims to be acting on behalf of a larger social group or a part of it. Okay, so I'm gonna close now. I'm just gonna quickly run through Earhart's defense of the right to revolution. So Earhart's defense takes the form of a response to the argument. It consists in offering an alternative account of injustice to that which is offered in the natural law tradition. He argues that there is a kind of injustice, the instantiation of which signals that the state has completely failed to fulfill its moral vocation. From the perspective of natural law, a state in which this kind of injustice exists is no longer a state at all, but as Earhart puts it elsewhere, a hell from which human beings ought to save themselves. In this case, there is an obligation to transform the basic laws by revolution, and the potentially deleterious consequences of revolutionary action 
cannot defeat this obligation, for Earhart thinks even the wholesale abolition of legal order would be morally preferable to the current state of affairs. So in this case, Earhart thinks we can know that things cannot be morally worse because of the presence of very distinctive kinds of injustice. As Earhart puts it in his letter to Forberg, which comments on the argument of the revolution book, it will be better that there were no law at all in the world than that humanity be degraded. Now, the kind of injustice Earhart has in mind flows from the basic laws of the society, and it harms individuals in a very distinctive way. It's not just the individual who suffers as a being with particular concerns, opinions, and interests, but also Earhart claims the humanity in her. So he says the humanity in the agent suffers. Now, Earhart's thought here is really rather cryptic, but I think that it can be explained roughly as follows. As we know, the basic laws confer on individuals certain fundamental rights or constitutional rights that determine their legal status and the legally permissible treatment of them. We also know the basic laws are the most fundamental and authoritative public norms of a society. Now, in the case where the basic laws are unjust, they confer on individuals a legal status that is not commensurate with their moral status their dignity as self-determining rational beings. This status is conferred on individuals as members of a social group, for example, feudal serfs or African-Americans, and in virtue of general characteristics that mark them as members of the group, for example, descent from unfree parents, skin color, etc. Now, what's crucial about this confer of legal status, Erhard argues, is that it determines the legally permissible treatment of individuals and authorizes certain forms of treatment of them. Thus, from the perspective of feudal law, and here I have in mind the law surrounding Leib Eigenschaft, there is simply nothing wrong at all with the feudal lord beating, selling, or bequeathing his serfs. It is a perfectly legitimate and justified act. The upshot of this is that unjust laws, the unjust basic laws, occlude the humanity of certain individuals, hiding it from sight, and license the treatment of them as less than human. In this case, Earhart thinks the humanity in the, in, it, in the individual suffers and is harmed, and this justifies, indeed, he thinks morally requires revolutionary action. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Thank you very much, James, for this uh, very clear and, and rich talk. And um, yeah, so now we have uh, time for a discussion. Please um, use this raise hand function. Yeah, Mike. Uh, thanks, thanks, James. Um, uh, my question is about uh, the. I mean, so so it was really interesting hearing the material about um, uh, Wolf and Achenval. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, in a certain sense, I mean, we could say that Earhart's view is just much more democratic than their view. Um, and as you point out in the way that he treats um, De Fornema, right? Like they, <laughs> uh, uh, Wolf is really concerned about their special status, right? And for Earhart, they've become um, the oppressors, right? And not somebody whose status is to be protected via political action. Um, I guess my, it, the, I know it, so there's that difference between the views. Yeah. Yeah. And then you also noted uh, briefly that there's, there's a difference at the level of normative foundations between the views. So the Wolfian view is perfectionist, uh, consequentialist. The Earhartian view is Kantian in some sense, right? And I'm wondering um, if you think there's a connection or what, ex like, is there, a, is, there an in, is there a philosophical explanation for the, the fact that Earhart holds 
a more democratic view, right? That like, is there something at the level of basic uh, normative principles that accounts for that? Or is it really just like they occupy different positions in the class structure and, you know, they have different concerns? I think it's as boring and interesting as the latter, right? But I'm not sure if at the normative level, right, there is anything that drives those commitments. Yeah. But what's, I mean, what's, I mean, I guess there are basically Kantian commitments about humanity and equality and things which are doing work here, which are driving this position. So perhaps that's one of the things. Yeah. Is that what you had in mind? I mean, that's, yeah. Of, yeah. So, yeah. so I guess the thought is that, you know, the thought is we're all committed, you know, we're all rational self-determining agents. He thinks that there's a moral obligation to enlighten ourselves, that everyone should be enlightened equally. And I think that does drive the egalitarianism if that's what you have in mind. Yeah. Um, whereas Wolf and Apple have seem very happy with these very unequal social structures. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, Paola. Uh, Paola, do, do you want to? Um, yeah. Um, thank you, James, for, for that. I, I found um, this thing about the, the this kind of incipient class struggle idea is just fascinating. My question has to do with the with the basic laws. The way I understood your your argument is that for Earhart, be, because they're not contract contractually grounded mm -hmm. and this story that you very briefly talked about the power grab and possibly the the domination of this um this imminent this kind of nobility it seems to me that in this story the nobility has the first say on the basic laws and and thereby sort of by definition and by origin going to be unjust because they're going to be you know looking looking after the interests of, of only one part of society so is, is this the case because it, th that would be a different story that you start from a situation of of um historical situation of injustice the basic laws will always be unjust until they are appropriately reformed in the light of of, of natural law is yeah. What do you so think? That, so that looks right. So the thought is, and actually in the revolution book, and Mike can correct me if I'm mis misremembering, but the story is about enlightenment, right? So you actually want to say that the distinction between the nobility or the quality, how we want to describe them, but the distinction between them and the people actually arises from relative degrees of enlightenment, so that they have actually attained relative to the people majority. And that's why they assume positions of power and political authority and the people acquiesce because they're simply not intelligent enough or self-interested. But once the nobility, and he thinks that's in a way is, is justified and warranted, right? But what happens then is that the nobility try to hold on and secure their position and entrench it. And in a way this will involve, you know, structuring society in certain ways um, and legislating in certain ways. So he says that all right, all positive law, and this in a footnote, I think, to Devil's Apology, he says, um, all positive law um, arises historically and is impure, and it has to be purified to the level of natural right. So we have this historical kind of power struggle, if you like, and dynamic, whereby the people should claim its kind of autonomy and its majority. Does that help at all? Absolutely, which interestingly sort of makes revolution inevitable, right? Because yeah. it, the, the basic laws will will have to be rewritten. No, that's right. And he and he does say this may take place, but so he does at one point talk about evolution, right? So he said if you had, if the nobility were suitably enlightened, they would realize they'd have to grant okay the people who are demanding majority and rights, so they'd have to grant this to them. And were they to do that, then he says we could have a process of evolution where the um, basic laws are peacefully revived and transformed. Um, but he thinks typically that won't happen. There'll be a struggle. Super, thank you. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, Pavel. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for that, um, James. So I also have uh, on the same, on the same uh, point that I found interesting that this idea that um, the state is uh, a small elite oppressing a 
a, a kind of majority. So you glossed it as class struggle, but it really is it's not really, really class struggle. No, it's not. Right? Class struggle. Come on. Well, it, it actually reminds me of um, populism. It's almost it's notoriously difficult to define populism, but I think most definitions um, define it as kind of like a discursive feature where you the populist presents society as uh, an elite which oppresses uh, a majority, something like that. So it sounds almost exactly like what you, how you described Earhart's um, view. And um, I don't know if those were Earhart's words. So he, he used the word folk, which also yeah. it's, and the reason I find, well, there's various reasons why I find it interesting. One is that um, he's not, uh, the, the origins of populism don't usually go back that far as far as I know. So maybe he's a kind of a hidden, um, predecessor to that tradition and where do you think and if that's the case where do you think he's getting this stuff from do you have any any thoughts on that um i'm not sure i mean i don't think the worry i mean is the worry that these elites who are oppressing the people is that the sort of thought you know that uh, what do you mean you know so is it's the thought that the idea is it's the people versus certain elites elites who are trying to dominate them the thought, of, the thought of populism, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Is that the... Yeah, that's usually how populism is defined. Um, so that 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 looks exactly like Earhart as you presented him. So it'd be interesting if he was a, a kind of a predecessor to that, to to well, to that kind of tradition, that kind of populist tradition. He might be. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Say that. I mean, in a way, the work, and I, and I kind of left this out of the talk. But there, there is this 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 very strong emphasis on enlightenment in our heart on this notion of enlightenment and basically having a moral obligation to strive to enlighten ourselves, um, a duty to enlighten ourselves. And that's really what drives it. And he thinks that there are forces, if you like, which are trying to kind of impede that enlightenment and to constrain us in the exercise of rights and duties that are universal. So that's really what's, I think, driving what's going on. And I think, I think you find that in Fichte as well, right? So Fichte does have you find it the reclamation, the freedom of thought, where he talks about these shadowy kind of elites and cabals who are trying to cheat the people of their um, their rights in a way and prevent them from becoming autonomous. So I wonder whether that's perhaps a more general feature of that kind of tradition. Sorry, Mike, do you want to think on that? Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think that I mean the the more radical phase of the French Revolution in the early 1790s was full of that kind of discourse as well, where like, um, you know, uh, there's foreign agents coming into France uh, who are polluting the true will of the people, which is the sans-culotte, right? And so that justifies all of their um, violent uh, oppression, right? So like the, the sort of um, the sort of Jacobin press in Paris in the early 1790s, you, f you found a lot of these kinds of these kinds of like proto, I guess proto populist sorts of claims, right, that are used to justify um, political violence. So I think that it's sort of in the air and finds its way into into the f philosophical writings as well. Yeah, the on that this so you said Fichte mentions these shadowy cabals as well, and then there's the Jacobins. But the way uh, in in Erhard you said it's because of the nature, the way that the state is founded, right? It's it's usually founded by a group by well, by one. I think there is a sort of origin. And what do you think, Mike? I think there is a kind of origin story there, isn't it? That, you know, that's this is how states are founded through this kind of arrogation, like right? people take a, and initially it has some kind of legitimacy because these people are enlightened relevant to the, relative to the other people. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there is that story there, Pavel. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of a state is necessarily... So, I mean, you know, you could have Fichte talking about, you know, the, this, these small, these shadowy cabals yeah, yeah. Or take over a state, but it seems like for Earhart, structurally... The foundation of the state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's okay, interesting, that's yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, do you want to say something, Mike? Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, got, I got excited. Uh, I mean, I think probably James's suggestion that 
um, a closer reading in connection with the second discourse would be on point here would help. I suspect that James that James is exactly right that he's getting a lot of that he's getting a lot of this from uh, the second discourse. Yeah, I mean he has a real problem with law, right? So he thinks law is a sort of vehicle for justifying domination. Of it. Yeah, I think that's interesting in the natural tradition. Um, yeah. So, uh, any further questions? If not, then we could uh, perhaps uh, close our discussion here. And thank you so much, James, for your talk and for this nice discussion. And thank you. And uh, and thank you all, uh, all of you, the three speakers. Uh, it was a very productive uh, discussion uh, since the beginning. And um, so, yeah, thank you so much for accepting the invitation, for being here, for uh, presenting your papers and, and for the whole discussion. And so um, just uh, I will post here in the chat the program of the uh, Leuven seminar. Uh, we have this term, uh, two more uh, meetings, one in April, a workshop on Fichte, and uh, another one in June, uh, a paper on the antinomies. So you are all uh, very welcome to join. And uh, yes, so uh, thank you so much. If you want to stay uh, a little longer for an informal conversation, I will just uh, stop the recording and uh, we can uh, continue if you want. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>